Hey everybody, welcome back to Medicine Deconstructed. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Rutland. I really appreciate you guys listening and subscribing to the channel as I have altered my content to include more about the coronavirus since this is the pandemic that's ongoing. In today's episode, we're gonna focus on the summary of my thoughts surrounding SARS-CoV-2 and the disease that it causes, COVID-19. Take a listen, take a gander, let me know what you think. Hey everyone, some of the information I'm gonna talk about today is going to be repetitive from what I've talked about previously in regards to coronavirus. What I'm trying to do here is summarize my thoughts around coronavirus. I've given my advice to healthcare workers, I've given my advice to civilians and what they can do to help prevent the spread of this illness, which is the most important thing. But now we're gonna get into the science a little bit and what's floating around in my mind on how patients are presenting, what the virus actually is, and what it looks like on CAT scan, on x-ray, and potential management strategies, including therapeutic strategies. As we've discussed before, the coronavirus is one of the largest genomes in the respiratory virus category. It's got 30,000 base pairs. What does that mean? That means it's got a lot of genome and it encodes a lot of different proteins and also means that it could potentially mutate because it has so many base pairs. The flu, for example, only has 14,000 base pairs. So it's almost twice as big as the flu. The coronavirus is a single stranded RNA. What does that mean to you? Not much. It just means it's a single stranded RNA. Here's how the virus works in terms of SARS-CoV-2. Real quickly, the virus has on its membrane a protein called the spike protein. The spike protein will bind to the ACE converting enzyme 2 receptor, which is abundantly present in the lungs. It's also in the kidney. It's also on the heart. Hence patients with lung disease, heart disease, and kidney disease developing the most severe illness. What happens after that? The spike protein will bind to that receptor, the ACE2R receptor, or the ACE2 receptor, once it binds to that receptor, the spike protein needs a protease to cleave a piece of that protein to allow it to fuse with the membrane and enter our cells. Then the virus takes over our machinery and starts to replicate itself, causing more infection. So what does that mean to you guys? Well, when we think about mechanism of action in terms of virus, we also think about what kind of symptoms patients are gonna display, and we also think about potential management strategies. But let's get into the symptoms first. 65 to 80% of people are going to have a cough. 40 to 50% are going to have a fever. 15% of patients are going to have upper respiratory symptoms. So it's very nonspecific in terms of symptoms. Basically, they're cold-like symptoms. People are gonna feel like that. They're gonna feel a little congested. They might develop a fever, okay? And again, they might cough. So I think it's very important for you to pay attention to the people around you. Have you traveled recently? Have they traveled recently? Start to ask yourselves those types of questions because those are gonna become important. What are we gonna see on labs when patients come to the hospital and present with SARS-CoV-2? We're gonna see lymphopenia and leukopenia. Well, what the hell does that mean? Well, lymphopenia means that your lymphocytes are gonna be low in count. So we're talking B cells, T cells. Leukocytes are white blood cells as well. They're gonna be low in count. We also may see an elevation in your AST and ALT. These are liver function tests, okay? We're also gonna see perhaps a low procalcitonin. This is a molecule that we draw on patients who have severe bacterial infections. The higher that number, the more likely it is a respiratory bacterial infection. And in this case, we're saying that it's going to be low. We also might see increased activity of interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is a cytokine. I've spent a lot of time talking about cell communication. That leads to the recruitment of other white blood cells to a certain area. Its activity is high when inflammation is high. So in autoimmune diseases, its activity is high. 
in certain diseases within the hospital, like sepsis or septic, or septic shock, its activity may be high as well. What else are you going to see? You may see an elevated ferritin level, and this becomes important in patients that are developing what we call a cytokine storm. I have talked about inflammation specifically in regards to asthma and interstitial lung disease. This is the same concept. Once a virus enters your body, it creates a lot of cellular recruitment. So white blood cells will go to certain areas. When this happens in your lung, remember your lung is essentially a bunch of balloons stacked on top of one another. And there are pipes that carry air to these balloons. When your lung is infected, those balloons become full of white blood cells. But what's that mean? That means since they're full of white blood cells, they can't be full of air. So you get real short of breath. This is what happens. You might see an elevation in the inflammatory response syndrome, which may ultimately lead to hypotension, severe respiratory failure, including the syndrome that we call ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that's gonna to lead to significant morbidity and mortality management wise. Or let's take a step back here. Radiographically, what are we gonna see? Well, this becomes a problem for me because as you guys know, I take care of autoimmune lung disease or interstitial lung disease. When you're looking at CAT scans of patients with COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2, you're going to see bilateral interstitial infiltrates and ground glass opacities, all right? What does that mean? That means that this infiltration, the whiteness, the increased lung attenuation on CAT scan is going to follow the secondary pulmonary lobule. If you're a pulmonologist or if you are a hospitalist, internal medicine doctor, any kind of doctor that pays attention to CAT scans, the CAT scan might look like a sign that we call crazy paving. Diffuse ground glass opacities, increased interstitial infiltrates that follow that secondary pulmonary lobule. If you see that in the appropriate patient population or really even now in someone that has no disease previously, you have to be thinking about COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2. In regards to management strategies, what are we doing from an intensive care unit standpoint and from a pulmonary standpoint? We've talked about protecting ourselves. I'm assuming that all of us are protecting ourselves to the utmost ability. We're all protecting ourselves, that's obvious. Doctors, nurses, patient care techs, respiratory therapists, everybody's protecting themselves. From a management strategy, here is what I would suggest, and this is also what we're doing. We want to reduce the exposure. As someone's FiO2, so the amount of oxygen that they have, goes up, you start to add on more respiratory types of strategies. So you're using high flow oxygen, you're using non-invasive ventilation or BiPAP. Remember, BiPAP's a mask that pushes positive pressure over your whole face into your mouth. What are you creating there? You're creating aerosols, right? You're creating droplets that are all over this mask. I would suggest that as you're going up on FiO2, as much as I really, really don't wanna say this, I would suggest that we innovate early because at least in that case, you have a little bit of a closed system and you have these tubes or these systems of tubes almost collecting all of that material so people aren't as exposed. So we are intubating early and then we're providing supportive care. That is if their blood pressure is low, we're giving them fluids. Their blood pressure is low, we're putting in a special IV called a central line and giving them medicines to keep their blood pressure up. I've already talked about having that code discussion with the family, with the patient, with friends that are at the bedside. That's very important in terms of potential therapies. What are we doing? Let's think about this. Most of the therapies these days are compassionate use. But as I've mentioned before, medicine seems to almost be a little bit backwards. We start therapies on people who are severely ill. Now, wherever I'm covering, whatever hospital I'm covering, if I see a patient and they have COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, I'm probably gonna start the therapy maybe a little bit earlier than most. Because for me, I wanna protect the severity of illness. I don't want it to get to that point. Understanding how the virus works, again, spike protein binds to ACE2R, fuses with our membrane, needs a protease to cleave the spike protein to really get into our cell. What kinds of medicines are we using? Well, here is what we're using. First of all, the way that kids 
have not responded to this pandemic, in other words, kids aren't getting infected, it's probably because they're immune to coronaviruses because they see them all the time. How do you create that immunity? Well, you develop an antibody to the spike protein, right? So the antibody binds to the spike protein, therefore not allowing it to attach to the cell and not allowing you to become infected. So my first thought is, how do we develop neutralizing antibodies to the spike protein globally? How can we do that and give these to people to protect them? That's one. Two, remember I had said that the virus needs a protease to enter the cell completely. We should be using protease inhibitors. And in fact, there are studies that show that two medicines in combination, lopinavir and ranotavir, have some efficacy against the previous SARS epidemic that happened in 2003. So that medicine in combination is called Kaletra, that's the brand name. But lopinavir is the protease inhibitor and ranotavir is an inhibitor of some liver cells to not allow lopinavir to be metabolized as quick. So we use those drugs in combination together. We've also noted that a medicine that we use commonly in parasite infections called chloroquine can be of some use. Perhaps this will not allow the virus to enter the cell as well. So in some patients, we are using chloroquine. In severely ill patients, Gilead has provided these patients with remdesivir, which is a nucleotide analog that confuses the viral RNA polymerase. So the viral RNA polymerase gets confused and the virus cannot produce it's proteins to survive, so the virus basically dies off. These are all potential management strategies in terms of taking care of these patients with the disease COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2. But it's up to us as a society to stop the spread of infection by social distancing. I can't stress how important this is. For those of you out there on the front lines, I encourage you all to read everything that you possibly can. I have, it's helpful. It helps us think about things. It helps us be creative. In times like these, science gets a boost. We can advance things. We can get things into production quicker because of the significant morbidity and mortality this pandemic is causing. My prayers go out to people in Italy, Spain, United States, and every other country that is severely affected by this illness. In terms of testing, I think testing should be, anytime we need to order a test, we should be able to be tested. We need to know who has the virus so they can be appropriately isolated and not spread it to other people, especially the people that are severely infected or have severe risk factors for developing severe infection. I am almost 100% certain that I forgot to mention something here. This is a quick summary. Most of this summary is backed by scientific data. Some of this summary are just my creative thoughts. I'm not here to participate in significant arguments. I'm here to summarize information for all of you. I appreciate you guys listening. I appreciate you guys watching. Tune in soon for more coronavirus content. And if you wanna see up-to-date content, up-to-date thoughts, just go to my stories on Instagram at Dr. J Rutland, D-R-J-R-U-T-L-A-N-D. I'm there daily and I will continue to update you all. Again, remember social distancing and also remember to subscribe to hear more content. I appreciate you guys all being here today and I hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot.